from Faith Lutheran Church in Elma, New York. I'm Darlene Miller. We're moving on with our study of the names of God with Anne Spangler, and I'm using only this book today. We are actually on lesson nine of 12, since last week would have been eight, and we skipped that week. Today we're going to start with an interesting one, the Lord my banner. It's Yahweh Nisi. I'm going to read the introduction that Ann Spangler gave us. I think there's sometimes a misconception because we sing that song, in fact we sang it at our church just recently, His Banner Over Me Is Love, and we think more of these kinds of banners. (laughs) or banners like you have at school. But actually, in ancient times, the armies carried standards or banners that served as marks of identification and as symbols that embodied the ideals of a people. A banner, like a flag, was something that could be seen from afar, serving as a rallying point for troops before a battle. We know that banners were used in Egypt, Babylonia, Assyria, and Persia. And the Israelites apparently carried them on their march through the desert. So when you pray to Yahweh Nisi, you are praying to a God who is powerful enough overcome any foe. Unlike fabric flags, ancient banners were usually made out of wood or metal and shaped into various figures or emblems that could be fastened to a bear staff or a long pole. Depicting birds, animals, or gods, they often glistened brightly in the sun so that they could be seen from afar off. A banner carried at the head of an army or planted on a high hill served as a rallying point before battle or as an announcement of a victory already won. Because banners embodied the ideals and aspirations of whoever carried them, they aroused devotion to a nation, a cause, or a leader. When Moses held up the staff of God in the battle with the Amalekites, He was holding it like a banner, appealing to God's power. By building an altar and naming it Yahweh Nisi, the Lord is my banner, he created a memorial of God's protection and power during the Israelites' first battle after leaving Egypt. So we need to consider one of the questions How is Jesus God's banner of victory for us? I remember one time in a ladies' Bible group where people, a couple of the women were kind of acting like, well, I don't detect that we're in a spiritual battle. Maybe that's not true of today. But the scripture tells us there is a spiritual battle going on for our souls. Christ was not defeated. And so the only way that Satan can hurt him is to hurt those who can never be plucked out of his hand. Scripture tells us that. No one, nothing, no power can pluck us out of God's hand. But that doesn't mean that sometimes the enemy doesn't try to thwart us to discourage us, to disable us, to debilitate us in some way, so that our purpose in God's kingdom is not accomplished. So because we have this banner, the Lord is our banner, we have to ask ourselves, whose are we? And to remind ourselves, we are under his banner. He goes before us. It is in his name and in his power that we step forward in the physical world and the spiritual world. 
So yes, we sing the banner over me is love. It's true. But sometimes I think we sing it like flower children, like love is all there is. This banner that we're talking about is related to warfare. And whether or not you want to acknowledge it, out of fear or out of apathy, I likened in that Bible study with the women to, you could be sitting on a ledge on the side of a cliff and think you're neutral. Say there is no battle or I'm not in the battle. But I the question we have to ask us is question number two, what does it mean to engage in spiritual battles today? What difference would it make if you could say, like Moses, the Lord is my banner? We have a wonderful rousing song in the Lutheran hymnal, and it's called Lift High the Cross. We sing it during our services. I love to hear it. I love to hear the congregation joining and singing that together. Lift high the cross. The cross has never lost its power. The cross will never lose its power. The power of the blood, the power of a finished work, the power of all of heaven making a new covenant with mankind. But we have to lift high the cross. We have to be behind the cross. We have to be claiming the power of that cross. So again, how might lifting high the cross of Christ help you to overcome? We're going to read Psalm 20, which is a wonderful psalm that talks about the banner. David himself, remember we've talked about David was a very powerful king. He was a warrior king. They lauded him for all the battles that he won. But his humility before God was as big as his exulting over victory in battle. And here's what he wrote. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of the Lord set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know King David, by experience, that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Chariots and horses were the signif significant indication of great might and power, especially in battle. But David, the great warrior, said he trusted in the might of the Lord. Remember, David started out winning a huge battle with nothing but a slingshot and his faith in his Lord God. That didn't change once he had the power once he did have the chariots, once he did have the horses, once he did have the, all the men available under his own control. But his hope, his faith, his trust, and the power he depended on was God himself. The next section is, The Lord is my rock, Yahweh Suri. I'm going to read from what Anne Spangler has on page 69. What better word than rock to represent God's permanence, 
protection and enduring faithfulness. When you pray to the Lord your rock, you are praying to a God who can be counted on. His purposes and plans remain firm throughout history. The New Testament, then, identifies Jesus as the spiritual rock that accompanied the Israelites during their long journey through the desert. He's also the stone the builders rejected, but that has become the cornerstone of God's church. So our warrior king David worshipped God by saying, Praise be to the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. That's Psalm 1 and 44, 1. Do you not think that God trains us for the spiritual battle that we are in? That's what the scripture and Christian fellowship and prayer is for. So thinking about rocks. Rocks provide shade, shelter, and safety. And were used to construct altars, temples, houses, and city walls. Heaps of stones were also used to commemorate important events in Israel's history. And how that significant is this? In down times, in times of fear, when everything seems tumultuous, to look at those monuments reminded them how God had delivered them in the past, how God could always deliver them through any other circumstances that were similar. God's commandments given to Moses were etched on stone so that all generations would learn his law. The word rock, again, epitomizes his enduring faithfulness. The Hebrew word sur is often translated rock or stone, while petra is the Greek word for rock. To worship Yahweh, suri, is to echo Hannah's great prayer of praise, prayer of praise in the temple. There is no rock like our God. That's out of 1 Samuel 2.2. An interesting question in our workbook was this. Knowing that God is your rescuer and deliverer, how might this affect your temptation to defend yourself or retaliate against those who are against you. How might this, in other words, affect your temptation to defend yourself or retaliate back against them? Who are against you? Who might have offended you recently by their actions or by their words? Who might have offended you unintentionally or intentionally? Who might have offended you with malice towards you or offended you without any malice, just out of ignorance? It's so easy for us to want to defend ourselves, to want to prove our point, to want to be on top in an argument to win, to be right. Can we learn to let God be our defender? I have a situation in my life where I have a past that some people don't understand why a pastor would marry. So I don't always share readily unless the Lord tells me to share. In my heart, he gives me the message that it would be helpful to someone else if I shared out of my past experiences and out of God's faithfulness in my life when I least deserved it. But when I do that, I do that knowing that he is my covering. He will protect me, he will protect my husband, and he will accomplish the work that he has set out to do by 
prompting me to share. But I tend to be like one that was raised on the west side in a tough neighborhood, wanting to defend myself, wanting to be easily offended sometimes by actions or words. And it's my nature to just rise up and want to retaliate or to fight against that in a way that's negative, not loving, not kind. I've had to learn that God is my defender. He's the one who protects us from accusations, even from the enemy. And in a situation, even this week, there's been a misunderstanding in our family. And, and I've had to spend time before the Lord to say, don't let me retaliate out of hurt feelings and cause further problems. The enemy would be thrilled, would be happy to perpetuate the negative within our family, to cause even greater problems. So I've had to learn to, just as this says, to hide behind the rock and to pray and ask the Lord to work out these circumstances, to trust him in the circumstances and to learn to be loving and kind within those circumstances. And also, the verse in Proverbs that says, a soft answer turns away wrath. It's difficult sometimes for us when other things are going on inside to give a soft answer. We can only do this with the help of the Holy Spirit. God, the Lord, is our rock. It's also our rock when we're going through troubled times and we feel attacked um, by circumstances, by things that are happening in our life, we have to remember we're standing on the rock. And it, we're unmovable when we're standing on the rock. The wind may come, adversity may come, but we're standing on the rock. And he is our fortress. In chapter 20, uh, I did mark the page, but right here I got it. In chapter 20, it gives us several names that are often clumped together. Our dwelling place. What's a dwelling place? We live there. Where we live. A refuge. That's where we run to when we need help. When we need to be safe. A shield. That's knowing that he is our protection a fortress, another safe place. A fortress is often signifying that there is some battle going on and we need to have a strong, safe place to hide in and our strong tower. I watched a documentary recently on the castles and towers in Ireland. Uh, impressive, strong, well-built places to run in times of danger where it couldn't be easily gotten into and where people went for safety in times of big trouble. Anne tells us that these descriptive names for God often appear in clusters in the Psalms as well as other portions of the scripture. When you pray to God your refuge, shield, fortress, dwelling place, and strong tower, you're praying to a God who has promised and who never breaks his promises to keep you safe, to watch over you. Psalm 91, 1 and 2 says, He who dwells, our dwelling place, in the shelter of the Most High, will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The Hebrew scriptures reveal a God who dwells with his people, first in a tent in the wilderness and then in Jerusalem. There he dwelt in the temple. The New Testament 
tells us that we are his temple. It took the idea of God's dwelling place on earth a giant step further by revealing a God who wants to dwell not merely with his people, but within his people. Now, I do always clarify there that the New Agers and and others, sects, will tell you that we become divine. We become goddesses. No, we do not. We are God's temple, but God's spirit is separate from us as people. Occasionally, scripture reverses this imagery in a wonderful way by picturing God himself as our dwelling place, our mound. Closely allied to this image of dwelling place is the idea of God as our refuge, or makseh. He is pictured as one to whom we can run for safety and security. The word refuge also appears in the Hebrew scriptures in connection to Israel's cities of refuge. The Hebrew word in this instance is M-I-Q-L-A-T, where people could flee for safety if they had accidentally killed someone. These cities were strategically located so that anyone in Israel was within a day's journey of one. A shield, or a magain, is another image of God's protective care. Ancient shields were often made of layered cowhide and were used in situations of close combat as well as to protect soldiers from rocks hurled from city walls. In biblical times, some cities were enclosed by walls 25 feet high and 15 to 25 feet thick. Farmers worked in the fields by day and then retreated within the city walls at night for protection. Large fortified cities also contained strongholds or strong towers that provided additional defense should the city's outer walls be breached. Like the other terms already mentioned, God is compared to a fortress or metsuda and to a strong tower. The questions that we were asked to consider. We'll start with number three. One of the more unusual metaphors for God in the Bible is that of an eagle or a great bird under whose wings the righteous can shelter. Eagle is a symbol of might. That's why it's a symbol of our country. But have you ever seen them with their chicks? Compare this with Jesus' more domestic image of a mother hen who longs to gather her chicks under her wings, as in Matthew 23, 37. We've talked about that image before. You could look it up on YouTube and see a video of a mother hen protecting her chicks. They're hidden underneath both of her wings. You can't see them. They're buffeted. These wings are buffeted by winds and rain. That mother stands firmly. She might be swayed, but her chicks are safe. How would your life be different if you were able to take shelter under the wings of God? Question number six asks us this. What are the things you fear most? How can you apply God's promises to your fears? And it takes us back to question one. What is characteristic of the person who experiences God as his or her refuge? Even though it talks about God protecting us, We live in a world where there are dangers, where there are evils. We have God's protection in many ways, some ways that we would rather not consider. Like, for example, if Christians are martyred, how is that God protecting them? How is that running to the fortress 
And yet the worst thing that has happened to them is that they've gone to heaven. Not that we seek martyrdom, but when it comes, God took away the sting of death. Death is us passing on into everlasting life. My husband, Bill Miller, is a hospice chaplain. And when he deals with patients, he has seen many kinds of people, many kinds of deaths. But he never needs comforting as much as for those who are not believers, who have no idea what they're passing into and the accountability that they're going to have to do, and who have no hope. Death is a very frightening thing for them. But those who are Christians often have wonderful testimonies, and many of them very peaceful passing because of the assurance they have that they're going home to the final dwelling place place with God, their Father. On page 100... There are several passages for continued study. Some in the Psalms that talk about the dwelling place. Some in the Old and Psalms, Old Testament and Psalms about being a refuge. Some in both the Old and New Testament referring to God as our shield. In the Old Testament and Psalms regarding God as our fortress. And Psalms and Proverbs who talk about God as our strong tower. These are wonderful resources. And I don't care who we are. There are days when maybe we're not feeling well or maybe we've just been bombarded. We've, we've incurred losses or we've lost someone we love. Or we've had news from the doctor that wasn't comforting. And we might feel a little bit scared, or maybe a lot scared, or low in our spirits. So I would advise that you write these things down now on index cards. Memorize them. Tape them to the mirror in your bedroom, one to the mirror in your bathroom, places where you will see them regularly, over the kitchen sink where you do your dishes or by the laundry. Stick it in your agenda where you're going to come across them from time to time. And remind each other. Share some of those verses when you know someone else is going through a hard time. That no matter what's going on here, it doesn't change all the things that we have in Christ. All the things that are his finished work that he is our rock, that he is our dwelling place, that he is our refuge, that he is our shield, that he is our fortress and our strong tower. And in the midst of the battle that goes on here on earth, it's under his banner, which means it's with his army that we fight. It's through Christ and the power of the cross that our victory lies. How is this going to change? How is this going to change your prayer life this week? I know some of you are having some hard times. But remind yourself and others by phone, by letter, by cards that God is all of these things to us. Have a great week, and I'll see you next week.